thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me. I'm actually very honored to be the representative for the New York City Health Department. What I'm going to present is all the different things that uh, the New York City Health Department has been doing in the area of diabetes. Much of it actually does not fall under my purview, which is why I'm very honored to do this because um, there were so many people that I consulted with and this is actually the work of hundreds of people across the health department. So it's actually very exciting. All right, let me see here. Did I turn it around? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna give you the framework of our approach. I'm gonna go over uh, various activities and then just give you a brief summary. Now, the thing I wanna say is that I can't give you the whole picture. It would take much longer than 30 minutes, which is what I've been allocated. Um, the other thing is, is if you have more questions or there's more details you want, there was actually a report released yesterday by the New York City Health Department. Um, called Preventing Non-Communicable Diseases and Injuries, uh, Innovations from New York City. So that is also available on the website, so there's more detail. Um, there's some other things talked about in there, such as tobacco, which I'm not going to address uh, today in this presentation. Okay, so this is not a novel slide, but this is the way I sort of organized my thoughts for today. Um, Surveillance and monitoring, you have to do this first before you can do anything, or at least you know that you want to do it if you don't have the information. Um, knowing what the problem is and then setting monitoring systems in place so that you can say, all right, I've implemented an intervention. Does it work? This is incredibly important. I'm an epidemiologist. This is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, there's policy development. So there's guidelines. There's legislation, making people do things, voluntary versus mandatory. There's program development, and then there's research and evaluation. Now, I'm just gonna focus on the first three, not because research and evaluation is not important, but again, it's actually a little bit more complicated, more detailed, maybe it's actually more complex. Or maybe it's complicated, I'm not sure, maybe both. Um, but I will talk about some sort of process uh, indicators and outcomes that we do have from some of the initiatives we've done so you can get a, get a taste of that. Okay, so I was thinking about how I wanted to present this. And so I thought of sort of four key objectives. There's decreasing access to unhealthy food, increasing access to healthy food, there's increasing physical activity, and then there's thinking about effective quality of care for diabetes. Now, again, you don't see tobacco on here. I don't talk about breastfeeding. Mental health is throughout all of this, actually, so I'm not gonna be talking specifically about mental health initiatives. But looking under quality of care, and I, I, I expanded on this a little bit because I think it means different things to different people, but for the purposes of this talk, it's talking about increasing provider access to technology, making sure that they have the right guidelines, technical assistance. This has actually been a big push for the New York City Health Department, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. Supporting access to care and making sure that there's certain resources in place for patients and providers. Okay, so before I get into it, I just want people to think about these things. Um, I was asked actually to talk about what New York City is doing sort of in the context of what can be done somewhere else that we've done here. And so as I was putting together the slides, these were the things that came up. So I had mentioned to you there are tons of resources across the health department that we're now sort of bridging a lot better than we used to. In the early 2000s, we weren't always all talking to each other. And over time, we've said, okay, there's no way we're going to be able to do this. We've got to start working across bureaus and across divisions but it's also working outside of the health department, and you'll see that in some of the slides. Um, there's effectiveness. Sometimes we know what's effective and we can implement it. Sometimes we don't have data, but we go ahead and implement something, and then we see if it's effective. Diabetes-specific versus population, and this is always sort of a big issue. Some of the things that I'll be presenting are diabetes-specific, but much of what the New York City Health Department is doing, we've taken a step back and have said, let's go population level because it will affect people who have diabetes as well. There's acceptability, this is huge. Will people accept what you're proposing? As you know, New York City's gotten a lot of pushback on a lot of the initiatives, and so that's always something to keep in mind. What works here may not work somewhere else. There's costs, that's been discussed all day long. Um, who's gonna pay for it? How long can the health department support certain resources, and how do we think about long-term sustainability? And then there's awareness, awareness raising, and, and this is really about all communities. It's awareness in the public sector, private sector, and also the people sector. I think someone talked about that yesterday at the NGO br uh, briefing, the three Ps. And I think that that's really true because sometimes so much of what we do, we can't measure the awareness that goes up, but it's actually one of the most important things because people start talking. Okay, so surveillance and monitoring. I don't have a lot of time to spend on this, but basically um, the health department, I think, has a very robust set 
of uh, surveillance systems in place to look at diabetes, uh, obesity, and the different risk factors. I think I've taken it for granted. I started at the health department in 2004, and so these things were always there. But when I talk to other people in other places, I realize that these things don't exist. But I do think this exists in a lot of places. How many people have diabetes? We get this from Behavioral Risk Factor Survey. We have a New York City Community Health Survey. Um, if some of you folks are not familiar with what that is, it's actually modeled after the BRFSS. It's a telephone survey. Um, but what's really unique about it, and you can see here we've had the increase in diabetes prevalence, of course, is that we can actually map what's going on in New York City at the neighborhood level. And this is pretty unique. And so uh, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with New York City, this is Staten Island, this is Brooklyn, this is Queens, we've got Manhattan here in the Bronx. And what you see is you see these hot spots, the, the darker colors are where we have a higher diabetes prevalence. You see the same thing, this is our obesity prevalence, which we get from the Community Health Survey as well. Seems like it's maybe flattening, which is good. And you can see the same thing here, you see some hot spots, it's the same places. Staten Island, not so much, it's a little bit different than diabetes. The reason why I'm showing you that is because much of the work that the health department does from a program perspective, not so much from policy because a lot of times policy is at the whole city level, but from the program's perspective is we focus on certain neighborhoods that have the highest need. And so when we look at the data, what we see is these have higher prevalence of chronic disease, risk factors, um, premature deaths, HIV, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. These are what we call our hotspots. District Public Health Offices, we actually have offices stationed in these neighborhoods with staff there. And so we have East and Central Harlem, we've got the Bronx, and then we have Brooklyn here. Okay, so then we did um, in 2004 a Haynes survey. We actually haven't done it since, so this is a little bit of old data. But what you can see is we have about 2 million adults who either have diabetes, diagnosed or undiagnosed, or they have prediabetes. That's about a third of the adult population, similar to national numbers. Also looking at that data, we can see the level of control. So you can see 45% of people had A1C less than 7. The smoking prevalence has actually gotten better. As many of you know, we're actually down to 14% now, which is wonderful across the whole city. 17% um, had an A1C that was 9 or higher. And I didn't put it up here, but 10% had the A, B, and C controlled. Again, very similar to national. It's still actually not doing too well. Um, this is hospital discharge data. I think a lot of locales in uh, the United States are, have access to this. I don't know what it's like globally, what type of information is available. But here you can see what we did was we, this is a little bit old, but we looked at the DPHO, so it's those high need neighborhoods, and we said, okay, what's the difference in lower extremity amputation uh, hospitalization rates in those groups. And you can see that the disparity is closed, but it's still there. And so we monitor these things on a regular basis. Now, those are things I think that are pretty common, and, and most folks have them around the country. This is something that started new. It's the New York City Fitness Gram. It's actually the Fitness Gram, but then it, we have adapted it in New York City. Um, currently, we get data on about 750 to 800,000 students. This data is actually from a smaller sample. It's 60,000 students. But what you can see, this is our public school system. So this is K through eight, and almost 40% are obese or overweight. And we can look at this on an annual basis. And this is really helpful, because a lot of the interventions we do, we can actually see if these numbers are changing over time. Um, OK, so I put this in surveillance and monitoring. So we actually looked at sort of food availability. And I'll talk about the programs that sort of came out of this a little bit later. I, I separated them for the purposes of presentation. And what we did was we went to two of those hot spots, those hot neighborhoods, and said, what does the food landscape look like? So we looked at where are the stores that people get food, and then we said, okay, what types of stores are they? So two-thirds or more of the food stores were bodegas. Those are those small grocery stores. If you've been here at least today, if you're not from New York City, you've probably seen those corner stores. Um, so they're, they're everywhere they're the, in these neighborhoods. And if you look at the food that's in them, there's not actually a lot of good quality food. Not a lot of fruit, uh, not a lot of leafy green vegetables, and not a lot of reduced fat milk. Um, actually quite low. And when you look at this compared to supermarkets in those same neighborhoods, theirs are actually much higher. Or if you look at other neighborhoods that have higher income, those are also, they have more accessibility to these foods. If you want more details, it's actually a very detailed report. These were done in 2006, 2007. I have the um, hyperlinks down at the bottom. Okay, this is related to food availability. This is the supermarket index. 
This was actually done by the Department of City Planning. So this is, I think folks have been talking about how health can do one thing, but then there's other partners. This is, this is pretty amazing. I cannot explain the details of exactly how this was done. There's, folks are interested, they could, there's a website, I think it's called Going to Market, and it goes through this in great detail. But you can see, again, there's neighborhoods that don't have a lot of supermarkets, and we know that that's an opportunity for certain interventions, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Okay, this is really exciting to me. This doesn't, again, this doesn't fall under me, but uh, this is a primary care information project. It's been a project uh, going on at the New York City Health Department since 2005, and the goal is to get as many primary care providers with electronic health records that have decision support um, in place. And there's a lot of technical assistance that goes to this. I know it's a little bit hard to see what this, what this shows, but built into that project was public health reporting to the health department in aggregate, de-identified data of certain indicators, what we think are sort of important things in clinical care. Some of them are process and some of them are outcome. And what you see here, actually, some of the outcome days, you can look at blood pressures controlled, cholesterol is controlled, A1C is controlled. So actually the number here is 20% have A1C controlled. The reason why it's lower than the other slide that I showed you is because this program was rolled out initially in providers that had a high proportion of Medicaid patients. And so you would expect that the A1C control is not going to be as good, given some of the issues with the Medicaid population. But this is incredibly exciting. I think this is a wonderful surveillance system, and it keeps growing and growing. Okay, so I think this is what a lot of people want to hear about the, the policy and program development. So what I did was I started with the decrease E, and I started kind of from big going down small. So big policy, then programs, and then media and awareness. So here are sort of three big ones, trans fat, uh, national salt reduction initiative, and food and beverage standards. So the trans fat restriction, I think folks are very familiar with. It's getting the trans fat out of food in the food service establishments. The NSRI is uh, we have targets set for different types of food, trying to get the salt reduced by 25% in packaged and restaurant foods. Um, then we have food and beverage standards, and this is at multiple levels. This is a little bit complicated, but we have city agencies now that have to follow certain procurement standards. There's daycare center requirements for types of food that can be served to children. Um, then there's sort of institutions that will come on board voluntarily to the, the food procurement guidelines that the city agencies are required, and vending machine uh, uh, standards are also built in here as well. So uh, right now, and actually that's a typo, I apologize, it's 98% of the food service establishments are compliant with the trans fat um, restriction. 28 food groups have signed on. It's some of them are uh, restaurants, some of them are um, manufacturers, and the 11 city agencies actually have the procurement rules. So basically food that you purchase with city money for a city event has to meet certain criteria. Okay. Now this is increasing access to healthy food. Now this has been done at multiple levels. We work with mobile vendors, we're working with the bodegas, so the corner stores, we're working with supermarkets, and then working with farmers markets. So it's trying to go across the whole sector. So with green carts, this was started I believe about a year or two ago, and the idea was to make available permits so that there could be more mobile vendors that could provide fresh produce in low income neighborhoods. The goal is to have a thousand of these permits across the city. The Healthy Bodegas program, so if you remember the, the food availability survey that I showed you earlier, there's not a lot of fruits and vegetables available, not a lot of um, reduced fat milk, other types of healthy food. So we work with bodegas to try to get the food to change. Now what's really interesting, and this was mentioned before, the concern, right, with the bodegas is if they change the food, they will lose business because the demand might still be there and they'll go somewhere else. So linked to this has been community outreach so that you can actually get the demand to change so that then what's showing up in the store is actually healthier. And this has been very challenging, but it's actually incredibly important. The fresh supermarkets, and let me make sure I can remember that what this stands for, it's food retail expansion to support health. And this, I got it right, thank you. <laughs> um, this is uh, zoning and financial incentives to get more supermarkets in places where they don't exist. Um, and again, this is in the low income neighborhoods. It's linked to the supermarket index uh, report that was done. Um, healthy supermarkets, this is where we provide technical assistance to existing supermarkets so that they have uh, more fresh produce available. I don't know how many people in the audience live in New York City. 
I remember when I moved to New York City, I was traumatized by the quality of produce in the stores. The greens go bad after two days. There's something about New York City produce, but part of this, <laughs> I don't know what it is, uh, and it's probably worse in some neighborhoods than others. Um, and basically, trying to get the people, the, the produce folks in the supermarkets to learn ways to keep the produce fresher, to present it in a way that's pleasant, that people will buy it. And so it's a lot of technical assistance on that, on that venue. And then there's farmer's markets. We have nutrition workshops at farmer's markets and cooking demonstrations. And then the other thing is, is there are these things called health bucks. They're $2, you get them for free, and you can actually use them to purchase fruits and vegetables. The other thing that I didn't put on here, I ran out of space, is you can actually now use your EBT card for your food stamps at the farmer's markets. And so people can use their food stamps to buy fruits and vegetables at farmer's markets, which is great. So here's kind of where we are. So we have 500 permits issued for the green carts. We are working with 60 bodegas on the bodega project. The first supermarket opened, the first fresh supermarket opened in the summer. There's others in, in the works. It actually takes time for that to happen. There's 40 markets that participate in the healthy supermarket, so that's where they get the technical assistance. And when we've looked at data, so this is, this is kind of interesting. So we've looked at the EBT sales at markets where they were letting people use their food stamps to purchase fruits and vegetables, where they had the health bucks, and you get a 40% rebate. So for every $5 you buy fruits and vegetables, you get $2 back. The sales actually have doubled at those markets. So people are purchasing more using their food stamp card um, where they have this incentive. And I think that that's a fantastic thing because that's what we want people to do. Okay, so then there's media education and awareness. I sort of put it in one category, calorie labeling. Even though it was a policy move and it was a mandate, um, it did raise awareness and it was an educational effort. So this was at the chain restaurants in New York City. And then of course folks are very familiar with reducing the con consumption of sugary drinks. We've had a big campaign for that. Had a multifaceted media campaign. It's been print, video on YouTube. Some have, has any, who's seen the video on YouTube? Okay, I've got to, I'm going to have to put, uh, I'm going to have to send a hyperlink when we, um, when we get these uh, slides up. Um, and then the community outreach to encourage institutional changes. So the idea is that you get people to stop serving different types of things in um, their organizational events. So what we've done, um, I'm just going to continue on that frame. We're working with 116 faith-based organizations, 200 employers, and we've reached out to um, hundreds of community-based organizations. There's a large group of people at the health department that are doing this outreach. As far as calorie labeling, I know there have been a lot of different studies published. I'm just mentioning one here, um, which was we looked at the receipts and we looked at it, uh, we did interviews with people and 15% of the customers reported using the calorie information and then among those people, they purchased on average 100 less calories. So even though it was for a small subset at least that was 100 calories less, if you actually add that up, if you're, if you're going every day, let's say, to purchase, it ends up I think being about five pounds or something like that. So theoretically that could prevent weight gain. Okay. So let's get to physical activity, because we were talking about food, now we'll talk about physical activity. So changing the outdoor space. This was mentioned earlier today. Um, the New York City Department of Health worked with 12 different city agencies to put together these active design guidelines. They, uh, the website's up there. Um, it's basically a manual of best practices, and it's for thinking about how you design and construct new buildings, and also any type of renovations that you want to do. Um, we work um, with department, I think it's Department of Transportation, I'm not 100% sure, for street closures. And the idea behind this is to get more places in the city where just all of a sudden people can get physical activity. This isn't the food vendor beat bit, it's actually just people going out and doing things in the street. It's closed off to cars. And then um, the Department of Health has been supporting the other city agencies that take the lead on this. Um, and trying to increase bike lanes, bike parking, pedestrian plazas. The idea is to get people more interacting with each other and walking more. Okay, so the active design guidelines, over 1,200 architects, planners, and designers have been trained. They've actually come to training sessions. Um, surveys that have been done said that their knowledge increased, that they're planning on using it. Of course, we have to see what happens. We have to see what the buildings look like over time and does the, the landscape actually change Street closures, uh, we've surveyed parents 
at the time of the street closures and have said, what would your children be doing if this weren't here? And they say I'd, they'd be inside if this weren't, um, if this weren't in place. And then um, what's one example of sort of trying to increase uh, sort of foot and bike traffic? There's lots of different examples, but one of the things that was done in 2009 is pedestrian plaza was put in place in Times Square. I can't remember how many lanes of car traffic there were, but it went down, I believe, to one or two. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I live about four blocks away, and I can just walk over there, and it's, it's amazing. You just walk in the middle of the street. Um, and it basically reduced uh, the nitrogen dioxide in the plaza by greater than 40%. And we, we know that there's going to be impact on all sorts of aspects of health, particularly cardiovascular disease. So this is a good thing. OK, changing indoor space, right? So there's outdoor space, indoor space. So the ADGs do address indoor space, so I'm not going to go over that again. But there's also been a stair prompt campaign that the health department's been doing where we're working with um, different institutions to try to get these posted because we know if you put these up people will actually go and use the stairs if they know where the stairs are. A lot of times you don't actually take the stairs because you don't know where they are and you're afraid you're going to get locked inside. That happens sometimes too. Um, so, uh, so far what we've done with the stair prompt campaign is over 25,000 have been distributed. Um, there's over 1,100 buildings participating and when they've done observational surveys to look at stair use before and after it has gone up. Um, not a lot, not as much as sort of what's been published. I believe sort of it's expected to go up about 50 percent, anywhere between 10 and 40 percent in the two buildings that they looked at. Okay, um, this is sort of stands alone. There's um, guidelines for physical activity in daycares. So there was a change in our health code that required a certain number of minutes in activity for kids um, and that there was a limit on TV time so that if the child was two or less, absolutely no TV time and then above that, no more than an hour. Okay, increasing opportunities for physical activity. So this is sort of the, the resource piece. This isn't policy, but it's resource. So there are free aerobic classes in underserved neighborhoods. Nobody has to pay for these. You can just show up. We call that Shape Up New York. And then in June, we launched the BeFit New York City website, which was done in conjunction with the Department of Parks. And there's a search engine in there where you can actually find low-cost fitness opportunities, it's, you can do your meetups. Um, it's also linked to Facebook, so you can actually have different um, fitness groups sort of from a social uh, media aspect. Okay, shape-ups in 40 locations, and as I mentioned, BeFit New York City uh, just started in June 2011. And this is another program for physical activity. This was a curriculum, it's called Move to Improve, and it was developed in conjunction with the Department of Health and the Department of Education, and teachers are trained. Um, K through five, and the idea is to get the kids moving throughout the day, but then also integrate it into the academic sessions and learning. So teachers get a manual equipment. 60 workshops have been completed with 2,300 teachers trained across 300 um, schools. And one of the issues is that we know that kids are not getting the, the, um, the required amount of physical activity. I believe it's 120 minutes um, for the week at the state level and on average they're getting about 45 minutes a week. So this is an effort to try to increase the physical activity during the school day. Okay, I only have a handful of slides left. I'm going to get on to sort of the quality of care piece. So shifting gears, because we we're just talking about food and, and physical activity, now we're talking about clinical care. So one of the things we focus on is making sure that providers have guidelines in hand uh, and that there's materials that providers and patients can use in the, in the clinical interactions. This was just discussed before me. So um, we have different types of guidelines. The one sort of specific for diabetes, we have diabetes, hypertension, medication adherence, panel management. They've been published at different times um, throughout the past several years. The way we get them out to providers is we put them online, but as soon as they're created, they're usually somewhere between four and eight pages long. We actually mail them out across the city. We have a list of providers, usually go out to over 20,000 providers. We used to have a program called Public Health Detailing where we had Department of Health representatives go out and actually um, send the sort of public health message, take tools out to the providers. This was done in our Hydney neighborhoods. That actually was discontinued in 2010. And then we have a series of patient materials that we, you know, either um, we keep up to date or people like them, we just make them available and people can order them and we, and we send them out with self-management goal setting sheets, blood sugar logs, general fact sheets on diabetes. Um, okay, now this is actually really uh, incredibly important. This is thinking about the system change. And so this is access to electronic health records. Um, Primary Care Information Project, as I had mentioned, started in 2005. 
Uh, the key activities are to provide technical assistance so that people can implement the electronic health record. The electronic health record has decision support in it. They actually asked all the disease content individuals to uh, let them know what were the important decision supports to put up in there. So for instance, a trigger for diabetes if someone was over seven, something like that. Um, they also go out and give guidance to the providers on how to use this electronic health record to do population management. They serve um, as a health information technology regional extension center. This is actually with federal dollars to trade, train 4,500 providers in meaningful use of electronic health records because that's attached to f money. They assist the practices in obtaining patient-centered medical home certification, and there's also a couple of paid performance programs. What's really interesting about what they're doing, right now they have about 2,500 providers participating. It covers over 2 million patients. And they're able to get the aggregate data, like I had mentioned, on key quality indicators. But now what they're developing, and right now it's, about, it's covering about a third of the providers that they have. So they have 2,500. This is about 900 providers. They actually have a data system where they can go in and do ad hoc queries. So say, for instance, you want to know what the immunization rate is for influenza among people who have diabetes in these practices. They can actually go in, do the query, and get the number out. And it, it, we, it pays attention to all the HIPAA and privacy issues. There's no identifiable, identifiable data that comes back to the health department. But you can't do that with the aggregate data. It will just give you vaccination rates for flu, and it'll tell you how many people have diabetes, but you can't cross those two things. And I think this is incredibly exciting because if they get the 4,500 providers in, it's going to cover over half of the city population. And so we're actually going to have a surveillance system to look at quality across the board in a routine fashion. Okay. This is what I've spent the last five years of my life on, and I only have three slides, <laughs> but that's okay. And I probably only have three minutes. Uh, yeah. So uh, the, the, we have the New York City A1C registry, sort of similar in, in thinking uh, with the electronic health record, although it's obviously not electronic health record. It's using public health surveillance to do quality improvement. And it was a response to the problem we were having with diabetes and that we weren't controlling risk factors. And the idea was that we could work with providers and patients by using this surveillance system. So we send back reports to providers. It gives them a summary of their performance in their panel. Um, we mail letters to patients that have high A1Cs or haven't been tested. We deliver and link resources to providers and patients, and we do surveillance and epidemiology on this data system. Now, you might think that these two things are redundant. They're actually complementary. The idea is that there's some practices that have electronic health record and some that don't. So for those that don't, this is very helpful. Even for those that do have electronic health records, they've said that our mailing letters to patients is actually very helpful because it takes an administrative burden off of them. So um, the way that we set up the registry is it was another health code amendment. And we require all laboratories to send test results to the New York City Health Department. This was effective in 2006. To date, we have over 3 million people in the registry. So who was paying attention? Do we have 3 million people with diabetes in New York City? No. This has a lot of people who are getting screened for diabetes because it's an A1C registry, not a diabetes registry. Um, 150 healthcare facilities are either getting reports or letters. It covers about 20% of the city population. Because we targeted providers that served high need neighborhoods first, when you actually look at those deep, that DPHO population, we're covering about a third of that population. We gave away glucose strip kits. We gave away uh, recreation center memberships, sort of just trying to make more resources available to patients. And we have a randomized control study that we actually are doing with Dr. Walker, Albert Einstein, um, looking at the impact of telephonic intervention among South Bronx residents on A1C, and we're in year five. Um, evaluation of the intervention that we're doing, the reports and the letters, is actually underway. I'm hoping that we will have results in the next six to eight months. We've done a lot of process evaluation, which is currently getting put into a manuscript right now, but the outcome data probably won't be available till next spring. And this is what the letters look like that we send to patients. We get permission from the, um, from the doctors, and we send it out on their letterhead, and we send it for them, and it says that we're, they're working with us and it's personalized, it actually has their name, and it shows that they're actually up in the red. This was focus grouped, we took this to lots of different groups, lots of people made sure that this was the right type of letter that didn't scare people. Um, we've sent out over 50,000 of these letters, and we send 600 or 700 of these a week, which to me is a very scary number because we're only covering 20% of the city. If I turned this on for the whole registry, I'd be sending thousands a week which tells you that there's a great need. There's a lot of people with high A1Cs out there. 
Okay, last two slides. Um, the last thing that we really try to do is we want to make sure that there's resources available, and we try to do these through different type of policy initiatives. Sometimes what we do is we do pilot projects, we do research projects, and then we take it to the policymakers to say, okay, this is something that needs to become part of usual care. So two of those things, um, we've been doing a self-blood pressure monitoring cuff um, distribution project where we give cuffs to providers and then providers give them to patients. We have an RCT. Um, we are going to finish uh, enrollment, I believe, in October, and then we'll have a year uh, to follow up and look at the blood pressure. And the idea is that we can take it back to the state and say, we really want this to be covered. They do cover manual cuffs, but they don't cover completely automated cuffs, and we know that that actually will work. Medication therapy management, this is using pharmacists to actually do self-management and trying to have the provider, the pharmacist, and the health plan part of this pilot project to figure out a model that will work. This is not a novel concept. People have done this in lots of different places. Doing it in New York City is complicated. There's over 20 health plans. There's thousands of providers. So it's trying to create those linkages. So we're working on that. And then the last thing that we're doing is um, really trying to help get the National Diabetes Prevention Program rolled out in New York City. Um, this was already discussed, sort of the background. There's different components of it. Community-based organization delivers it, but you've got to get the people there. So either the doctors refer patients or the, the individuals themselves can self-refer. Um, but we've got to get people to, to pay for it. We have to get the insurers, unions, employers, whoever to reimburse. So our role is we've been working through our networks to try to tell people about the program. We can actually use the registry to see where prediabetes individuals are and find the doctors that actually serve them and try to get them connected. We're working with the YMCA, which is one of the first community-based organizations to be stepping forward to do this. And we are um, meeting with different people to try to get this to be a benefit that gets paid for. And we're also working with the state and some of our advocacy partners to try to get this to be something that's covered by Medicaid because that's going to be a big issue um, in New York City. So in summary, as you can see, all of these different activities require cross-collaboration within the department, across different city agencies, going beyond even government, right? This is sort of that conversation across sectors. Some of the initiatives have a very strong evidence base. Some of them do not. In either situation, we have to set up monitoring mechanisms to say what does work and what doesn't work. Some of the initiatives were not well, re well received. I didn't talk about that at all, but trans fat, there was pushback. Salt, there's been pushback. I think there still is. Um, calorie labeling, A1C registry. I can go through the whole list. Um, people have to be willing to take a stand, and, and you have to really believe in what you're doing. So that may not work for everyone. Um, Long-term sustainability is really important. I think sometimes we do pilots, and we say, let's do a pilot. Sounds like a good idea, and I'll figure out how I'm going to translate this later. No, it really needs to be part of the planning process. It's incredibly important. And the last thing I want to talk about, which I think is really, really key, maybe your indicators don't change, but doing something, getting the conversation starting, raising awareness is probably one of the most powerful things we can do. We can't always measure it, but um, it's something I always keep in mind because if you don't do anything, I think someone said, what's the cost of doing nothing? The cost of doing nothing is no conversation and silence. The cost of doing something is the conversation. So I'm going to end. Thank you.